Hello and welcome to the fourth instalment of the Future of Venture Capital. My name is Dee Kotak and I'm part of the expert network of Consilience Ventures. This uh, fourth instalment will be on medtech and investing in medtech, both from the perspectives of the entrepreneur and the investor. And we're very grateful to Singularity um, for running this series in, in partnership with Consilience Ventures. I have a diverse background. I work with early stage healthcare companies uh, across a broad range of areas from med tech to biotech, um, you know, encompassing things like medical devices, neuromodulation, AI and cancer diagnostics. I'm currently a member of the Consilience Ventures Expert Network and I'm also a Chief Business Officer of Novase. I have a background in medicine and law and moved over into sort of business about 10 years ago, finding out that um, my real joy in life was, was building things and new technology. So what is medtech? Medtech is a very broad sector um, and it covers technology that can be used in the healthcare setting, uh, which covers disposables, PPE, ventilators, infusion pumps, CT scanners, MRI, robots, scalpel blades, you name it, anything that's essentially hardware uh, and or software. And uh, the biotech pharma side being drugs, biologics and the like. Uh, the green rectangle on the left of the slide illustrates the, the leading areas of, of conventional med tech, traditional med tech, which is in vitro diagnostics, cardiology, imaging, orthopedics, ophthalmology, surgery and endoscopy. Um, the med tech market size is, is considerable. It's approximately 600 billion a year with a CAGR of 6%. And as in all aspects of healthcare, it's being driven very much by the aging population and the increasing prevalence of comorbidities, as well as increased knowledge driving consumer demand. On the bottom of the slide are, are some names of the major medtech uh, players at the moment. And it'll be very interesting to see as we go through this presentation, whether those names will be there at the top of the list in the next five to 10 years. Is medtech innovation at a crossroads? There have been a, a number of headwinds in terms of uh, medtech innovation and its funding. And uh, I'm not going to drill down in immense detail into all of them, but I, I think that I'll just sort of highlight a few key areas. You know, the financial downturn that um, not just affected medtech, but it was across all industries. There was decreased, um, you know, funds available for, for the early stage companies. And, and it was much harder to, to fund any, any form of um, company uh, at whatever stage um, and we've worked through that and unfortunately we've now arrived in 2020 and we are you know with COVID-19 so I think again that's going to feed into some of the difficulty with uh, funding. Um, the, the other thing is is that the um, environment in which medtech companies operate is changing all the time. In America, there was the Affordable Care Act, which was a 2.3% tax on medical devices. And strangely enough, Donald Trump has, has uh, revoked that this year. Um, but medtech companies need to demonstrate improved um, efficacy, safety, and cost benefits. There's a much higher bar for bringing a new product to market and getting it adopted in, in, into clinical practice. Um, and, you know, additionally, the hospitals are far more sophisticated in their purchasing and their grouping together and driving the price down. So there are a lot of um, um, what do you say, challenges 
to, you know, for the med tech company getting into the marketplace. Um, and that's against the backdrop of the usual increasing regulatory challenges as well. The FDA is more demanding, although the timelines might be a little bit more certain. And in Europe, we've had enactment of the uh, a new medical device directive, an in vitro diagnostics directive. And historically before, for a medical device uh, manufacturer, they try and seek approval in Europe and then go to the U.S., now companies are actually just starting in the US, which is the biggest medical device market in the world. Also, um, in terms of the med tech space, the major players, there's been consolidation. There are nowhere near as many big med tech players as there are pharma players. So um, traditionally, again, in, in medical technology compared to pharma, they tend not to uh, acquire uh, technologies and companies early on. They tend to track them. They tend to wait until they're more commercially uh, successful. And they're, they're very risk averse. They don't mind paying the premium. So they wait until a company has its FDA approval and or is commercially successful in the marketplace. And what this has meant is that um, VCs who've invested in med tech companies are having to invest more for longer, which is decreasing their return, their rate of return. And so there's been declining VC investment overall um, in, in, in the early stage med tech space. There's still investment in, in series B onwards, but the investments are larger and that's taking money away from the early stage. So if we look at Medtech investment um, over the last sort of seven years. This is uh, quarterly, and the the graph on the left. If you look at the grey line, you can see that sloping downwards. And that's number of investments in the med space, and you can see the investment in terms of the amounts. And you know there, there was a recovery after. 2008-9, um, but again, it, it's, it's going downwards. And if you look at the graph on the right, um, the key take-home message here is in 2006, as a percentage of VC medtech investments, um, in 2006 it was 19%, and in 2016 it's down to 10%, so it's halved. And... Um, you know, that declining investment um, is making it harder for the early stage companies. Um, with the decreasing returns to VCs, um, the demands uh, from the limited partners is such that it's forcing them to start looking in more lucrative areas, such as health IT, digital health, and biopharma. Um, so, that's a background to the sort of general healthcare, what it is, medtech, what it is, and a background to the trends in terms of medtech sort of traditional investing. Um, but the good news is that um, there's still plenty of investment. And um, this, this slide's looking at medtech series A's. And the blue bars on the left, that's showing that in terms of digital health, um, there's plenty of money pouring in and it's outstripping, in fact, a traditional med tech. It's almost double now. And I think that is likely to increase uh, more and more over the coming decade. And the other thing to note is that in the graph on the right, uh, the sorts of investors coming into med tech um, there's an increased range of investor. So as well as having the traditional life science VCs, they're now corporate VCs, tech companies, consumer health, um, specialist health IT investors. So there's a broadening of the investor base. Um, so this is what I would like to, to sort of now focus on a little bit more, um, is looking at the digital health space because this is where the growth is. Um, and in the poll today, uh, one of the questions was, what is the, um, the growth rate 
the CAGR and digital health. And I was pleased to see that that twenty um, percent was the most common answer. In fact, it's it's almost thirty percent, um, and that compares to the six percent in traditional med tech. So it's an exciting area to to be in right now. Um, and and we, Dee, is it is it fair to say that in the digital health side of things, there's less regulation, uh, and there are more opportunities to get you know, fast use cases um, commercialized as opposed to the med tech? Yeah, that's like a really med-tech. interesting question. I think the answer to that would be there's, there's certainly less certain regulation. And the, the adoption of um, digital health um, is variable and in the sense that it's still new and it doesn't fit easily into the sales cycles within hospital and within the way they assess health technology. And so the, the uptake of it, um, it has its challenges. Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, over time, there's going to be a, it's going to become quite unclear as to what is consumer health, what is health, um, and and what is is, is sort of um, more more clinically based health, mm. and there'll be a, a coming together of of consumerism and uh, med, medical technology mm. for sure, um, and I think that has to work its way through. The FDA have always been fairly reactive, but strangely enough, they're trying to be more proactive in the regulatory aspects of, of healthcare um, and digital healthcare because they understand it's going to be very hard to try and keep following it. So that's an encouraging sign. Um, mm-hmm. Fine. So um, other, th- other things that are of note in the space is... Um, you know, some of the, the top companies in, in the last 10 years um, ha- have not been traditional med tech companies. And you're getting um, companies like Kaiser Permanente, an insurance company in the US, Ascension Health. And I'm sure everyone's aware now of you know, Amazon, Google, Apple, IBM now becoming participants in, in, in this health space. And in fact, leading it and driving it because they, they have um, the financial clout and the technology. So the next slide is really to introduce you to to the broad gamut of um, what is digital health. And so top left, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all the rest of it that you can see. And and what is really... um, amazing is that you've got a a coming together of a lot of sort of exponential technologies, um, technologies that are in the really um, um, sort of big uptick in terms of their growth rates. And uh, they haven't even started yet in terms of the way they're going to play out over the coming years. But what's exciting is there's sort of a convergence and sort of intersection of all these technologies together. And um, you, you can see in the box on the right, the Internet of Medical Things, um, where in 2017, that market was about 40 billion. And um, just, you know, in, in about five years, it will have gone up to 160 billion. So, Every day there are headlines about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, the healthcare space, you know, what is it going to do? It's going to produce um, a more joined up, integrated, safer, quicker um, experience for patients who are going to become consumers. And there's going to be a lot more emphasis on well-being and trying to prevent um, either illness or people needing to go to hospital or bouncing back into hospital once they've been in hospital. And all these technologies 
are going to contribute in various ways. And I think, you know, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the areas that AI and machine learning are going into. So in terms of diagnosis and reducing errors, anything that has a pattern and you know, a visual pattern is prime target for um, machine learning. So whether it be pathology slides or x-rays, and we're seeing the first companies there actually uh, getting into the marketplace with their AI, because where there are large numbers of, of we call them pictures, x-rays or slides that need to be looked at, there's variability from the pathologists and radiologists, as, as well as them getting tired and fatigued. And so we now have AIs that are able to work alongside. There's a lot of talk about replacing doctors, but what, what's been found that each on its own is very good, and together there's actually a, a better either sort of detection rate or safety and the like. And so, you know, it's coming into all sorts of areas from patient management systems to drug discovery and discovering repurposed drugs, which we're talking about again in COVID times. So um, I could go on forever at this, but I think the key take home is these are the areas that are very exciting, that are exponential technologies that are synergizing together. The market is large and growing very, very rapidly. So these are the areas which um, provide many more new opportunities than traditional med tech. So a couple of questions that are yes. popping through, uh, mm. you know, uh, uh, healthcare so far, uh, uh, the way that it's set up at the moment is more like sick care and you uh, deal with the symptoms after, you know, after the fact. Uh, but a question from Dominic is, are there any uh, signs from uh, healthcare providers, state or private, that they've actually started to pay for the prevention um, of deteriorating health? Yeah, this is a really excellent question. Um, and Dominic has actually hit the nail on the head. And there is a direction of travel, not just in value-based healthcare, but in preventative and keeping people out of hospital. Hospitals are very expensive places. And yes, there are some early signs. Um, so, for example, in, in digital health, you know, I think pair therapeutics um, has uh, some, some applications in terms of uh, addictive behaviors, in terms of opioid dependence and the like. And there are a number of applications now that are finding their way into daily management for specific conditions, whether it be opioid dependence or depression, um, women's health. These are all active areas that are attracting um, sizable uh, funding rounds and are actually getting into market. And I think Pair got its first uh, digital treatment, essentially approved by the FDA in, I think, 2017. So we're at the beginning of, of, of that journey, where, and it's going to increase very rapidly um, over the coming years, for sure. Okay. So um, another question that's come up, and it was also something I was thinking about as you were going through all of these technologies, going digital in health, uh, also means there's a great amount of data uh, and we need to be thinking about uh, privacy of data uh, and the risks of, uh, of, of that privacy. You know, how, how will, so the question from Jelena is, uh, how will data privacy uh, impede commercial research? Is it something that protects us in the long run, but uh, stifles innovation in the short term? Um, and, and particularly in the prevention space. So that's, a, you know, all of these technologies here center around uh, data uh, processing and also privacy. So that's a, um, another uh, really excellent question. And I, I think that one, one or two of, um, in the audience may, may remember the headlines from, I think it was Google, 
and the Royal Free Hospital in terms of, of data um, sharing or data breaches. And it is um, certainly a drag on research and innovation in the, um, the, the safe data handling. The um, GDPR in, in Europe um, means that there has to be more specific consent in terms of the usage of any data stored, um, as well as in terms of uh, an algorithm um, being able to offer up an explanation of how um, an algorithm arrived at um, a, um, an action. Mm. Uh, and, and so, you know, these things are complex and difficult. And so they will. Um, be a, you know, I mean, there's no doubt there will be an impediment. Mm. Um, and well, therefore, this needs to be planned for at an early stage. One needs to have, um, you know, a system of practice and operating that, that early on addresses these issues. And there's no doubt that, um, you know, if one talks to um, purchasers of uh, these sorts of technology in terms of the healthcare world, um, yeah. Privacy and, and confidentiality yeah. and cybersecurity are all way up yeah. there. In and, that's a, and that's exactly what Jelaine has come back with. Uh, you know, people are generally okay with opening up their data if it's leading to to research. It's when it gets to commercialization that there's more sensitivity. Having briefly looked at some of these great new technologies that are, that are incredibly profound, because um, AI is just going to become ubiquitous and and pervade every aspect of our lives. Um, so there's going to be a new model of health. We don't entirely know what it's going to be, but there's a direction of travel. So what is that direction of travel? And how are med tech companies um, going to reinvent themselves to be uh, meaningful, relevant, and um, profitable in the future? Um, this is a busy slide, and the audience will be relieved that I'm not really going to talk through all of those boxes. All I really want to do is, is, is talk through the uh, data platforms, well-being, care delivery, and care enablement as rather than thinking rigidly that the company is a hardware producer um, or is active in a certain disease area, medtech companies of the future are, are going to be something else. So we can have our data platforms. So we've got the data convener where um, that business model is based on accruing the data, um, storing it safely, and um, integrating it into one area where it can be accessed and used by the AI, by the science and the insights engine to um, produce its actionable insights, and that would be their business model. And then you've got the platform builders that um, have uh, an infrastructure that, that will go through a hospital or um, a, you know, e mm. e you know, even something that's you know, bigger nationally where, where they, you know, there is a standardized platform that everything else can plug into and play. Um, and then the well-being and care delivery, well-being is going to go up the list of priorities and that prevention, as well as keeping people out of hospital. So you're still going to have your um, health products developer with their incremental uh, advances to their devices, but all these devices are going to be smart, they're going to be linked, they're going to have software, and they'll plug into new healthcare paradigms of you know, this consumer healthcare model, mm. which is sort of community-based, and then with little sort of specialty areas, whether it be, you know, by, by age or by sort of condition, um, where that would be essentially your sort of teaching hospital bit. And I don't want to dwell on that too mm. much, but just to take a step back and, and say that in the future, companies will be cutting across various domains where they wouldn't have before to be probably one, in one of those three areas, data platform, well-being, care delivery, which is sort of more traditional medicine, and then care enablement, which is, you know, using your AI in terms of the supply chain and other things. But 
the key word here is interoperability. All of this works only if there is great interoperability from all the software, from all the hardware, etc. And that's going to be a major challenge for the future. And it's something that every um, company should be thinking about. How can they make themselves as interoperable as possible? And just a comment uh, yeah. from last week's session. Uh, there, were, there were some recurring sort of uh, trends here. Uh, you know, last week, we, the whole session was on AI. And um, uh, one of the comments out of that was that data is becoming central to prediction and then also the ethics behind the data and then who owns that data, uh, putting it into training models. And then, you know, does the training model uh, owner have uh, proprietary over the, uh, you know, the solution? So uh, no doubt about it, the data uh, is becoming crucial for um, almost going uh, beyond healthcare and, and the adjacencies that it allows you to uh, propagate into. And we're seeing that from all the platform providers. So data, AI, that predictive uh, capability that it gives you uh, is, is, is showing up in many of the discussions that we're having, which is interesting. Yes, um, data is, is more than just the electricity. Um, you know, it, it, it is very, very valuable. And again, for the entrepreneurs, if they are involved in dealing with, with data mining and producing algorithms and stuff, they need to clearly define um, the rights and the responsibilities and the IP um, to what they're doing. Um, and again, it, it, in terms of collaborations, it's not always well defined and, and does le can lead to more than disharmony, you know, including litigation. So this is an area that, again, where um, it's in development and, and people, it's not an automatic reflex, but I think that increasingly so that how data is handled and who has what rights mm. to it, um, you know, academically and commercially are very important to clarify at the outset of any project. Um, so if I may just sort of switch tack to um, offering up some suggestions to the entrepreneurs, you know, having said that Series A funding is, is, is quite hard, um, it's a good move if you are in the digital space because plainly there's more available. Um, and so you know, this is really just... A sort of general thing both across traditional med tech and digital health tech is that because um m a is is really the exit at present uh in, in traditional med tech and i think 2016 there were there were only about three ipos so you've always got to be asking yourself um where am i going who's going to be the acquirer um but to, because the, the med tech companies and even the newer players wait for um, regulatory approval or evidence of commercial success, uh, it's difficult uh, in, in the early rounds, in the early years, to, to get that, that funding. So entrepreneurs have to be creative and look elsewhere for alternative funding, funding, funding sources and, you know, ideally non-dilutive funding. So we've touched on sort of the, the non-med tech um, investors. So there are an increasing number of, of companies out of the traditional med tech space who are now entering. And these, these are consumer health companies uh, in particular, and they bring expertise that med tech companies don't have. Med tech companies um, are great at a disease or a device, you know, they're, they're good at hardware. But the, the consumer companies really understand the client and the marketing and all that aspect to it. And so one can see that to stay relevant in the future, that traditional med tech are going to actually have to start partnering up with some consumer 
companies. So there is interest in, in funding digital health from consumer companies. Um, and one of the things that, that's filling that space that the traditional VCs have retreated from has been corporate VCs. Um, they're, they're quite active. Um, yeah. That's if your, your um, technology, product or service, you know, it, is a good fit for them. You know, traditionally, one starts with friends, family, and fools, and then, um, you know, look towards angel investors and family offices. Now, family offices don't traditionally um, have great appetite for healthcare because they lack the domain experience and they lack the network. But in my view, I, I think that one should look at them afresh in the sense that digital health is less complex to understand in some ways, not in others. So I think that it is a more accessible investment area for them. Um, it's always worth trying, you know, charities, philanthropic investors and disease foundations and any form of, of grants, you know, local, national, international, as, as well in as well as getting to know your sort of local accelerator, incubator, and university spin-out funds. Um, there's no easy way of fundraising. It, it's very hard work, and a, a CEO could spend 60% of their time fundraising. But you need to pursue all of these in parallel um, and see where you get, because obviously if you get any form of, of, of funding early on, that tends to bring other investors in. I, I don't want to teach you to suck eggs. I'm not going to labor this point too much other than the fact that from early on, don't think that you can go up to a traditional VC in the life science space and um, come away with a series A so easily. Um, it, it's a bit more difficult than that, unfortunately. So from an investment perspective, if you know we're to look at a company as uh, potentially being uh, an investment, um, you know, what are the things to look at when you're kicking the tires, when you're talking to the management, when you're looking at their business plan and the like? And again, I'm not going to give a comprehensive talk in five minutes, but I just want to touch on a few points. And right at the top is understand your end user. The thing about the techie folk is um, they, they don't necessarily get out and about and they're, are they going to go into a hospital and see who's using their app, how they're going to use it? So you have to camp out with the doctors, with the nurses, be in that strange and unfamiliar environment and spend days or weeks there really understanding how it's used, what the problems are, what the benefits are. So you have a deep understanding of its upside and its downside, the benefits and the problems it's causing. Doctors and nurses have so many alarms, so many messages, so many dashboards to look at, that it's really important to understand your end user. And again, you know, that's something that the consumer companies are very focused on because that's so natural for them. Some techie people feel they don't, you know, the app works, we don't need evidence. Um, if you talk to the purchasers, they would like to see evidence, even if, if something is fairly simple to use in the hospital environment. They want um, not something retrospective. They want real-world evidence. If it's something to help compliance or adherence with a therapy, with a drug, well, what is the real-world evidence to use of that um, application and adherence to the application over a period of time? Intraoperability, we've touched upon, um, critical uh, for survival in the future. What are the regulatory hurdles? And they change. Um, you know, the FDA has a new term, software as a medical device. There's the European uh, regulations, the uh, GDPR and the like. Intellectual property is critically important if you have hardware, because this is how an investor will early on assess the value in a company. Have you got freedom to operate? 
do you have a strong uh, IP portfolio? So don't underestimate the value of IP. It's difficult if you're in AI with an algorithm. Um, so you have to focus on other things. Cybersecurity we've touched upon. And reimbursement is a real challenge. It's very difficult um, because the benefit from your AI in the hospital may fall across different care groups. So who is the purchaser? Who gets the major benefit? And hospitals don't necessarily have a committee to assess digital technologies. And your way into a hospital might be through the cardiology department, but actually you're trying to sell to several departments. It's difficult, um, as is the model for scaling across uh, hospitals. Uh, or, or other healthcare environments. So these are the sorts of areas that I would want to drill down to in terms, of a, in terms of a company's business plan, particularly in the digital space, because there can be some, some big gaps that need filling. And I think it's very important to be aware of these early on. So I know time is, is, is marching on. So just, um, I, I, just a few sort of take home messages for, for the entrepreneurs really, which is um, if you have got hardware, um, don't underestimate the value of your patent portfolio when you're seeking uh, funding. Focus on in innovation. This is what you're good at. At the end of the day, think of yourself as outsourced R and D. Think long-term, start de-risking from day one in terms of your intellectual property, you know, cybersecurity, uh, reimbursement, because it's important to have plans for all of these things from the early, early stages. And also think where your subsequent rounds might come from and who you'd potentially be looking for as an acquirer. So think long-term, start de-risking. And what's really important that we're seeing is that have to show commercial potential. So it's not just FDA approval. Um, some early traction in the market is very, very important. This really makes a huge difference to um, being able to scale and raise the bigger rounds later on. So those are my main take-home messages to the entrepreneurs quickly at the end. And just to say in terms of consilience ventures, uh, we've got one um, medtech company in the portfolio, which is Syme DX. And uh, that, that company has two things, really. One is a, a new test that, that, that's um, emanated from their, their machine learning. And that is a test for uh, fit lung maturity. But that test puts them in the neonatal intensive care unit where what they will do is assimilate um, a big data set where they will then be able to use AI and machine learning for predictive analytics to be able to provide um, alerts to the neonatal nurses and doctors about, um, you know, babies are very fragile and have a lot of well-recognized complications. And the thought is that through the data set and the machine learning, one will be able to produce actionable insights. So that's a niche area, but that company would be able to dominate that area because there, there, there's nobody there in the neonatal intensive care space. That's just a little bit about the, the portfolio there. So thank you very much for your time and your interest. Hi, thank you, uh, Dee. I just want to uh, follow up with a couple of questions, just yeah. so that we've got every question answered. We had two questions from Ben and from Radwan. You know, at the beginning, you talked about uh, medtech being patient care, uh, device driven, uh, as, as in its in its state today. But going digital, it's using the data and using data to create insights. Um, yeah. Does that mean that we're uh, lowering the barriers to entry? which means that it will become a commodity venture. On the one hand, it's great because it means more entrepreneurs can uh, come into the industry that were not traditionally in the industry, bring their uh, uh, capabilities with data science and AI and start uh, building out new uh, business models. And then the other is that um, 
you know, does it become a flood and uh, um, become so easy to use that it's it then a wash? Uh, it's a really great question again, because what I envisage happening is there will be commoditization of the traditional med tech companies. So if they want to stay alive and stay relevant, they're going to have to innovate. And that means adopt, partner with, acquire the, uh, the new med tech companies. Um, so as with any technology, with time, there will be commoditization. Um, but you mentioned something which was very important that I didn't highlight or emphasize in my talk. Another thing to the entrepreneur is to, to be creative and, and think about new business models in terms of reimbursement. You know, um, that, that's also very important. So the answer to Radoan is that, um, yes, but I think that is decades away. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then the very last question from Ben, um, is a banding by approvals, um, uh, EL diagnostic devices type one or type two versus communication devices? That's a bit too technical for me, but um, does the, Ben, so I can actually ask that clarify bit, a little bit. So my question is about funding banding. Like, is it like distributed? Of is it, it's kind of a banding by who is funded by like, is it diagnostic devices? Like, are they band funded more than like communication devices? Kind of like, is it spread about the approvals? Does the approval required like, you know, the kite mark, the CE mark, the FDA approval, is that actually changed how funding has been distributed? Are people like going for the low hanging fruit these days versus the kind of higher risk? Um, that's a, again a really interesting question, and I don't have a feel of that, in the sense that, on the one hand, um, as you you describe, there's, there was always a tendency to go for the low hanging fruit, but when there's a more defined, clearer pathway. So in the US, you know, traditionally you had a five ten k, which is if something's been approved before or um, a PMA approval that took much longer, was much more expensive. Um, I think the issue is what market are you going into? How big is that market? Are you a market leader or are you a follower? Um, so I'm, I can't answer your question because I, I don't have a readout on it, but I put it, I'll answer it in a different way. I, I've not spoken to people who are, saying that, um, depending on the class of device, um, that they would completely avoid uh, investing in a particular area. Um, although uh, <laughs> Mitesh should probably not be happy with me sharing this. I only discovered the other day that in terms of classification of medical devices, a ventilator has the same classification as a condom. <laughs> that caused me much amusement to be. I'd just like to say thank you, everyone, for investing your time. Uh, it's been really interesting.